Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to open this webinar about randomness in medicine, subtitled The Role of Chance, Good and Bad Luck in Disease Causation, Prediction and Treatment. In 1981, Sir Richard Dole and Richard Peter wrote a broadly sweeping literature review of the external causes of cancer all kinds of external causes, like environmental, nutritional, behavioral. And this review was widely cited and quite influential. There was only one sentence in the beginning that was not widely cited and that almost everybody ignored. And that sentence read that the determinants of who will develop cancer should be divided in three categories. Not only the usual nature and nurture, but also luck or the play of chance. The second author, Richard Pietro, who, by the way, was uh, the Heineken Prize winner of this Royal Academy in 2011, had already honed in his views a few years earlier. And he had written, even when all details of susceptibility, all metabolic peculiarity have been elucidated, the complete and full description of cancer induction requires good and bad luck be invoked to explain why my brother got cancer and I did not. Ladies and gentlemen, is this still science? Is it scientific to invoke? good and bad luck as the cause of cancer in individuals. That is the topic that our three speakers will be speaking about. And that will be discussed afterwards. They will not only discuss randomness in the causation of disease, but also randomness in prediction and randomness in the treatment of disease. We would not only like to hear from the speakers, but we would also like to hear from you during the webinar. Please use the Q&A button via Zoom. Keep it short. You can upvote a comment or a question. The nice thing about this on online meeting, there are a lot of drawbacks, but the nice thing is that you can already put questions have comments while people are speaking and maybe comment on each other and upvote comments, because that will greatly help the chair of the panel discussion to streamline that discussion. Unfortunately, if you watch via YouTube, you cannot pose questions. Then I will start by uh, introducing our present first speaker, George Davis Smith, who is known in epidemiology in all kinds of roles and is actually also a role model for decades. His basis has always been his professorship of clinical epidemiology at Bristol in the UK. And his research has been in very many diverse fields about inequality, epigenetics, Mendelian randomization, and he also is the former editor of the International Journal of Epidemiology, a journal that he rejuvenated. Last but not least, he is what we would nowadays call an overseas member of our Royal Academy. George, the screen is yours. Thanks very much for that uh, very kind. Uh, invitation, uh, introduction, uh, and for the invitation to this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm uh, sorry that uh, I can't be in Amsterdam uh, in person, uh, but uh, hopefully that, that will become possible uh, in, the, in, in the near future. So I'm going to uh, discuss a chance as a fundamental element in uh, epidemiological thinking. And I'm going to start by uh, 
summarizing uh, by making some very broad uh, statements uh, about what I think we know about the role of uh, chance or randomness um, in um, the etiology of disease in, in the de development of disease. Um, what's from a paper uh, I um, wrote 10 years ago um, at, and the, the supporting evidence is in that paper and I'm going to try and move on from that uh, to discuss some new uh, issues. So I'd say, so the evidence that I reviewed back then in this 25 page paper, which is the perfect cure for insomnia, uh, if any of you are fortunate enough to suffer from that, uh, I put together um, data from quantitative genetic studies. So from this um, paper, I'm going to, um, I, I reviewed evidence from quantitative genetics, where for many phenotypes, health-related phenotypes, the non-shared environment, so what wasn't influenced by, wasn't caused by uh, genetic factors, what wasn't caused by things that, by fact, exposures that uh, people reared in the same household together, uh, shared, were, the, were seen as the major environmental contributor. But despite um, decades of research, many studies, expensive studies, set up uh, precisely to try and uh, identify what, what, what might contribute to this non-shared environmental component, uh, there was um, very little uh, success. Uh, a, 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 form, a, a fundamental paper by Robert Plowman, uh, published in uh, 1977, um, on why siblings from the same uh, family were so, di so uh, distinct, uh, other, that uh, other than uh, genetic uh, similarities uh, had very uh, had no more similarity than people selected, uh, very little more greater similarity than people selected from basically the same um, uh, population uh, where they came from, uh, contributed uh, to this uh, discussion. There's also uh, very considerable evidence from clonal organisms, which includes the human twins, but that show considerable variation in most out outcomes. Uh, and in, in the non-human organisms, these clonal uh, creatures, that uh, when you standardize the environment to the extent that it could be done, this had very little impact on standardizing the, the, the wide range of differences in uh, phenotypes uh, produced. And in inbred uh, species, for example, uh, you know, mice kept in uh, colonies for research purposes, standardizing the environment again had li limited effect on reducing phenotypic um, variation. Uh, and uh, I suggested that there were basically factors that we might as well call chance, might as well call uh, random, that were a key in the development uh, of disease. So I um, uh, you know, su uh, suggested that it doesn't matter uh, whether this is um, true ontological uh, stochasticity or whether it's just epistemological, that we, ne we can never know things that are never uh, possible uh, to measure uh, uh, in, in thinking you know, rationally about it. I mean, if you look at clonal crayfish, for example, and they grow to very different sizes in completely standardized environments. If you were a life course epidemiologist who was um, measuring every single thing those, those creatures did, there was no possible way you could actually come up with any sensible uh, answer to uh, why they uh, you know, became such different sizes or why uh, C. elegans uh, had different life expectancies, um, uh, uh, given that you, 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 you have completely standardized the environment. So, uh, so it's, it's not an epistemological, uh, it's not a, not a question of, of which it is. Uh, if there's literally nothing you can do about it, uh, you might as well forget and not, not worry. So I, um, I, I, used, I used this picture from a newspaper from Winnie, uh, uh, who um, was 100 years old and she was lighting a, a cigarette from a candle uh, on her 100th um, birthday cake. Uh, and, um, you know, she said she's, uh, she wasn't quitting smoking now. And now you know, if, uh, we might think, oh, well, you know, Winnie has particular gen genetic protection against smoking or uh, some other, other uh, re reason. 
but it's very likely that you have to have whinnies if, if, um, if smokers are dying at such a considerably higher rate you will still have some who, who make it uh, to 100 and uh, it's, it's unlikely you're going to be able to identify uh, why that is and I suggested that you know when Winnie was 60 maybe the postman uh, came not came and uh, knocked on her door at 11 a.m in the morning she opened the door gust of wind came and she coughed up some metaplastic cell, uh, cell. she had a cough and went back in and happily got to be 100 if the postman had come at 10:59 uh, or 11:01 um, that wouldn't happen have happened next Winnie is now joined is joined by Johannes Heister. Uh, now, for Johannes Heister, we know that he smoked uh, for um, nearly 90, for well over ninety years because he's photographed of smoking. He was a, a film star uh, in Germany. Uh, next, Johannes quit smoking at one hundred and six, uh, and he said that he was doing so for the love of his wonderful wife, who should have him for as long as possible. Um, his, his, uh, his wife does look vastly younger than him, but also possibly uh, there's been some work uh, contributing to that. Next. And the apparent role of chance is seen within as well as between organisms. Next. So imagine uh, bilateral organs like uh, kidneys, and then if you just click through now, one after the other. And you think uh, that you know they share the same DNA. If, if you're eating healthy fruit and veg, they, they both are going to be exposed to the products of that. If you smoke, both are going to be exposed to the products of that. If you drink alcohol, both will be exposed to the products of that. If you jog, both will be exposed to the products of that. But then, and one might one might develop a, one of the kidneys might develop a cancer. That means if that if that happens, then the other kidney has been exposed to precisely the same uh, exposure pattern to any meaningful way. They might cosmic rays might you know have hit one kidney rather than the other, but they've had the same uh, exposure patterns. And yet, if you develop cancer of the of the, um, of the uh, kidney par parenchymal uh, kidney cells, then your risk of developing a a, a contralateral uh, kidney kidney tumor is a, is great over the risk in the, in the uh, general population. So that's when you match on everything you can think about exposure wise. And uh, next. And this is seen also for uh, breast cancer. Uh, here you have uh, data from a large uh, Nordic study uh, where the yellow line is, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the, the, if you, if, uh, you have a dizygotic twin sister who develops uh, cancer, you see the you see the, the, the risk and, uh, and the bottom line uh, and then the uh, top line is the risk sorry is the risk uh, if, in, in, in your dizygotic twin sister if you develop cancer the bottom line is the risk in your, your dizygotic twin sister the higher line is the risk in, the, in your monozygotic twin sister and the yellow line is your risk of developing bilateral a, a primary tumor uh, of the opposite side which of course you, you have uh, only one breast uh, at risk for that, whereas your monozygotic uh, twin has two breasts, which is why she actually has higher risk of developing um, breast cancer than you do of developing a bilateral tumor. Now, now I mean, again, the, the um, breast has obviously been exposed to precisely the same exposure um, patterns uh, as has the breast that uh, developed uh, the tumor. Next. Uh, and now massive, this is a very recent, uh, huge study which demonstrates the relative, the, this uh, sort of small elevation of, in risk over general population risks. Uh, if you develop a primary tumor at age 30, where there's, it's, where there'll be a, a stronger familial uh, contribution, your risk of contralateral cancer uh, will, uh, is, only, is only elevated essentially to the degree to which you had elevated risk uh, in the first place. Uh, next. And this, uh, and this uh, yeah, next slide, yeah, and, and this can be seen if, if you have a polygenic risk score, which predicts uh, breast cancer risk. If you've had a prime, if you have a primary tumor, that polygenic risk score predicts um, you're developing contralateral breast cancer, but to basically the same effect size as it predicts the initial cancer. So that perfect matching and exposure uh, um, contributes rather little. Next. 
So the gloomy prospect 1919 to 1936, we, we think about infection uh, now. So let's go back to uh, the experimental epidemiology work of uh, that uh, Major Greenwood and uh, uh, William Topley established after the First World War and after the shock of the influenza pandemic. They wanted to understand the dynamics of, of infection, of transmission and uh, outcomes of infection uh, because of the because of the inability to do anything basically uh, in 1918 when Greenwood was in, was, uh, in the government health service, was a very major figure in the government uh, health service. So they set up a, a series of tightly controlled experiments uh, with, um, uh, with mice in colonies. Next. And it, next, yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, I'll just talk. So, so they, they, uh, they set up, um, uh, has this gone for other people? Has this gone, they've got now gone on to lots of slides? Uh, so yeah, they, they set up uh, these studies uh, where they had uh, large numbers of uh, mice who started out uh, uninfected and they had a controls where they just followed them up to get what the death rates were in mice colonies where there was no infection was introduced. Next. They then, yeah, next on the other, and they had a, a period, a running period, and then they would add an infection, an infected mice to the co to the uh, colony, and they would uh, see how that uh, how the infection was spread, and they would count the dead, and uh, they would also uh, uh, in a mixed infected and susceptible mouse colony, they would add susceptible mice plus mice with prior exposure to the infection to see what happened to them, and then uh, next. Uh, and they would also uh, test vaccinations. They would mix infected and susceptible mice and add susceptible mice and vaccinated mice and so on. So the, these inc incredibly controlled uh, experiments and the major, the major findings over 20, uh, nearly 20 years were... Next. Yeah, next slide, yeah. They, they, they used a whole host of different infections, including ectromelia. Uh, their, main, their main conclusions were there's just huge intrastudy variation. They thought that they were repeating precisely the same study and they would get completely, diff uh, completely different outcomes. Next. And, uh, and, uh, uh, well, and uh, in, in their 200 page report, they discussed the very important history of the controls. So they were trying to do these control experiments to actually get baseline rates. And very often there would be there would be suddenly be uh, unexplained high mortality in the control uh, in the control. So they did find uh, some things of important. They found that infectious dose was was important. The degree, the size of dose of infection that was that was uh, inoculated into mice. They did show that uh, attenuated live virus immunization was protective, but that immunized animals still carry and spread virus. Uh, obviously, relevance today. They, uh, when the immunized or survivors of infection became infected, they were often asymptomatic. They uh, generally uh, constant strain of, uh, of bug within epidemics, but some changes uh, would occur. Uh, and that uh, pre-existing immunity accommodates changing uh, the changing strain. Next. And uh, Greenwood, uh, uh, spent uh, several pages just discussing how one of the major conclusions of all this work was the, uh, was the role of, of uh, risk that they couldn't measure and they couldn't standardize even in this incredibly standardized environment. They, uh, uh, they, what, they cleaned the cages, these, the cages six days out of the week, of course, being uh, Britain in that time, uh, they didn't uh, do this on Sunday, but uh, every other day they changed the, <laughs> the, the cage, the, the, the clean the cages. The environment was exquisitely standardized. And he said that um, we should consider the hypothesis of chance a little more fully from the biological side. The result of injecting a fixed dose of bacteria into the stomach of a mouse may well vary according to the reaction <laughs> of the gastric juice at the moment of injection, the interval since the last meal, the rate of emptying the stomach and so on. It may vary according to the temporary condition of the blood plasma or leukocytes, according to the rate of lymph flow, according to the number and state of activity of the reticular epithelial cells and the sinuses through which the bacteria happen to pass, and so on ad infinitum. 
And there were these pages he went on to say we could never, ever hope to be able to, to, to measure these things. So this role of the, the chance that the, these stochastic events that they were seeing uh, were things we had to learn to live with. Next. Uh, and uh, uh, Greenwood wrote that you know that they probably killed, they sacrificed you know a couple of hundred thousand mice. And he said in, in each of the studies, they'd say they'd have 1,000 mice, which is a large sample if we were studying an individual biometric measurement. But in experimental epidemiology, it's not an individual, but a group, which is the unit. And the 1,000 individuals may provide us with only one group observation to make, which requires many months of study. In the 20 years of our work, hundreds of thousands of mice were sacrificed. The sample of group observations we assembled was, statistically speaking, a small sample. And this uh, illustrates you know, the key uh, per, uh, epidemiological measure, which are aggregate uh, measures, or the measures of disease in, um, in populations. And that the between individual effects are, to quite a large extent, uh, is a chance is a major contributor to the, what happens between individuals. And we can't hope to measure many of those factors. Next. Uh, and uh, these studies, these experimental epidemiology studies uh, continue. Uh, but I mean, the experimental epidemiology tradition, which was from the UK and the same hundreds of thousands of mice were sacrificed in the US by uh, Flexner and Webster uh, and others coming to the same uh, essential conclusions. Um, uh, uh, and, and it's really nice, a recent study, which looks at Drosophila fruit flies, and they have, again, completely standardized the conditions and they inject what they think of precisely the same amount uh, of, uh, of, of bacteria of, of, in, into genetically identical fruit flies. And, and they have genetically, they have clonal uh, bugs, so they identify the same, ex exactly the same bug to exactly the same amount. Uh, and, and yet there was huge variation uh, uh, in outcome and, and the, the death of the bugs, the death of the fruit flies being the major Factor, but they but they they couldn't under, they couldn't come up with measures uh, which actually predicted uh, the actual individual what was going to happen to the individual fruit fly. And then next, then uh, yeah, uh, and then this this crude picture that was drawn in the commentary on it on the on the on the bottom right, uh, you know, demonstrates that this the trajectory they say the the, the bacteria were in, injected. Uh, and it, and there'd be a stochastic event something very early on in how the the this, the, the injected organism was encountered was that was how it encountered the fruit fly, and their response could either lead to what would what, within the individual what would be like an epidemic takeoff that one would see of a disease in a population, or that it would um, uh, or that it would disappear uh, and, the, and the, you'd have a happy fruit fly. So this uh, inability. To, uh, to, uh, to predict what was going to happen, uh, what's going to happen to animals in the infection uh, field uh, is, uh, is, is, is clear and just, just continues. Next. So the implications of personalized medicine uh, is the a true, true prediction uh, is, is limited. Uh, um, when you think of the, uh, you know, the prediction, you think of the bilateral uh, breast tumors, or you think of uh, one's monozygotic twin, uh, the, the, the uh, revealed phenotype in one's monozygotic twin, the disease they uh, develop, uh, reflecting how, how the extent to which uh, genes uh, and the shared environment that they've had, uh, that they had uh, contributed to, uh, to things. And that best prediction is relatively small. And uh, the best prediction will actually be the early stages of disease. It's not, it's not prediction. And uh, um, uh, how disease influence phenotype uh, is indeed a major, it's probably a, it's often an important contributor to what um, falls into the non-shared environmental uh, category in the quantitative genetics study. Next. So, uh, uh, so that brings me on to this to the issue of uh, ubiquitous exposures, exposures which uh, are uh, everywhere, either in the environment or ubiquitous exposures that are shared uh, uh, across the body. I mean, the bilateral 
tumor uh, issue, of course, is, it is not special to breast cancer and to kidney cancer. Uh, the same, you know, the same would apply to the colon. And, you know, the studies can, can you know, demonstrate uh, how that's true. Although you don't have the perfect, you don't have the clean, uh, uh, um, you don't have the, the clean situation as you do when you actually have uh, when you have um, uh, bilateral organs. So, but consider we can consider ubiquitous exposures, like within the body, but also ubiquitous exposures across the environment. And uh, next, uh, and if you think of it, the obesogenic environment, would be one such uh, ubiquitous exposure. Next, that's the, the, the you know the prevalence of obesity has in, increased dramatically between 1991 and 1998, and has carried on. But when you look at different subgroups of the population, you see the same. In all the subgroups, this is by sex, and then next, uh, and this is by age. Well, uh, the straight lines because the data are only presented for 1991 and 1998. Uh, but you see, and then next, same by race. Next, same by education level. So there's inequality, but the but uh, but all groups were increasing, or by smoking status. So the obesogenic environment. Uh, was ubiquitous in that uh, situation. And then if you consider uh, an individual, um, you know, a substantial individual level risk factor, such as uh, carrying BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, um, which, you know, generate a uh, you know, high uh, risk of the disease, if you look at it as, as population uh, factors changed, menarche um, moved earlier, number of uh, children um, uh, first age of age of pregnancy, first child moved later. Total of children decreased. Uh, body mass index uh, uh, increased, etc. The uh, the actual um, uh, risk uh, was substantially was substantially uh, changed. It just went up uh, up across that time. And then next, uh, and. Um, uh, this very nice uh, recent study uh, experimental manipulations of diet in mice uh, and then relating that to the uh, growth of in, of um, implanted uh, pancreatic uh, tumors and thinking about how the, the tumor microenvironment uh, uh, influenced uh, influences the transition of the disease um, would be a, a, an indicator of the sorts of processes that one of ones one would be thinking of that this ubiquitous change changes the, 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 the risk, but within the individual, it's just it's a probabilistic uh, uh, transition to the disease or not. Next. Uh, so population reductions in risk, uh, in, in risk is, is required because targeting of, uh, individuals is, uh, has, uh, has uh, uh, limits. And you know, with sort of statins in the case of coronary heart disease and obesity, sadly, uh, might well require the same approach with the now successful uh, pharmacotherapeutic approaches. And then the next. So thinking of a ubiquitous exposure, um, that's a you know thought experiment, a thought experiment about exposure being completely ubiquitous. So imagine in Bristol. Uh, uh, everyone, you know, the law a dictator arrives and everyone has to smoke 20 cigarettes a day from adolescence on. You're not allowed to go to bed until you've, uh, you've got through, your, um, you've got through your, um, your, your, your 20 cigarettes. And then next. And I'm thinking Amsterdam, no one smokes at all. You're not allowed, the, the dictator there uh, um, in, in, uh, successfully um, abolishes smoking. Next. Yeah, next, then next. Then you follow up for 50 years, then obviously uh, Bristol would have much higher rates of lung cancer. Next. Uh, but within Bristol, how does smoking relate to lung cancer risk? Well, this is now a completely ubiquitous exposure. 100% of people smoke. Uh, obviously, there's no, you can't relate smoking to lung cancer risk. And next. Uh, and within Bristol, what causes one individual rather than another to get lung cancer? Well, there might be some uh, genetic uh, influence, uh, um, but, but uh, might be some occupational influences, but uh, by and large, uh, 
you will be looking at these sorts of factors that Greenwood discussed with respect to his mice, or one can think about with respect to Winnie. Next. Uh, and between Bristol and Amsterdam, obviously the whole the huge difference in rate of lung cancer is entirely is, uh, caused by differences in smoking. Next. So at a population level, exposure may be responsible for nearly all cases, but account for little of the difference in risk between individuals and be, diff and be very difficult to detect. It was truly ubiquitous um, uh, within the population. Next. And uh, between individuals, chance may be a major factor in who actually gets disease. So there's also ubiquity at the level of endogenous uh, risk processes, which for cancer is becoming, over the last uh, five years or so, is becoming increasingly recognized when searching for, when looking for driver mutations in healthy tissue. Next. So this is, uh, and, and, and just, yeah, next. So in, in somatic mutations in normal colorectal epithelial cells, many of, the, many, many of those cells are found to have, which, what would, which are considered you know, driver mutations of cancer. But in most cases, those, don't, uh, those are not uh, progressive. So one's thinking about what it is probabilistically, which means that, uh, in some, in, in the, that one will progress in one person, despite these, exist, these, being, uh, uh, these being present in, in everyone once you get to a certain age. Next, and this has been shown for you know, endometrial epithelium, which is very interesting. We also, in this study, you can sort of demonstrate that's very likely to arise relatively early in life. Next, uh, and, uh, and this, that this demonstration of this ubiquitous presence of these uh, mutations is leading to sort of rethinking about the importance of thinking about uh, tumor promoting uh, agents in cancer risk rather than thinking purely in terms of the uh, somatic, somatic mutations, like with the BRCA1, uh, we, we, you know, high germline risk, we saw that you know, the changes as the environment uh, changes. Next. So how can ubiquitous exposures uh, be detected? And, uh, next. So in the cancer field, uh, they've, um, the mutational signatures, which can reflect some exposures like uh, smoking, uh, and uh, uh, acetylic acid exposure, uh, etc. These mutational signatures have, have been sought in, uh, in large numbers of, uh, this, is, uh, these are, this is disease, this is esophageal uh, sam uh, samples. Now these were esophageal uh, tumor uh, uh, samples and they took uh, uh, samples from low incidence uh, con places, countries, and high incidence uh, con uh, countries. And they were, expecting that they might see uh, um, you know, uh, different mutational signatures in the, in the high in, um, uh, incidence countries, but they didn't, that um, wasn't found. And so the assumption is that there's microenvironmental and uh, systemic effects uh, which are, cha are, are changing, which lead to the uh, progression of the, of the, of the mutations uh, uh, to cancer. So, so this is quite. This is a, a nice uh, study design, um, uh, and the, the implications for ecological epidemiology are that uh, ecological studies of representative samples from low and high incidence communities uh, can be taken. In the that cancer study, they used uh, cancer, you know, these samples from uh, tumors. Uh, but if you're actually looking for what might be a ubiquitous, just a ubiquitous exposure in the in the high uh, incidence communities, you would want to, you can take uh, samples from, uh, from just representative um, members of the community. You uh, can detect candidate exposures that differ between them. So, um, you know, for, for example, if you, if you did have uh, uh, Amsterdam where no one smoked and Bristol where everyone smoked, uh, and uh, if you, you know, you'd have DNA methylation, uh, data, you'll be get a huge signal for, you know, for, for an exposure. That's the case where you know what the uh, ubiquitous exposure in, uh, in Bristol is, but you might be able to, to use these sorts of data from uh, ecological uh, studies to uh, have to develop hypotheses about the uh, exposures that um, um, are, 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 
uh, could be uh, important. Uh, and, in, and as these exposures may be environmental, then, uh, then you know, they, they may be thick, you know, things that are ubiquitous within the environment, then the work is required of environmental scientists uh, to detect these. So ecological studies uh, of exposures. And um, the, even if an exposure is ubiquitous, and if you do identify ubiquitous exposure, uh, and you have some knowledge of the uh, process uh, through which um, that, that exposure is, uh, is dealt with, uh, or, the, or the process of, of factors that might modify that, then you can use genetic variants that modify the exposure to identify the actual exposure. So for example, in the smoking case, if, if all you had was Bristol and everyone smokes 20 cigarettes a day, uh, but if you did look at the, um, at the uh, nicotine receptor variant, the, uh, the strongest single genetic risk factor for uh, lung cancer, which is CHRNA5, which leads to uh, heavier smoking, uh, the people who were smoking 20 cigarettes a day who have carried the high risk variant will be inhaling more, smoking more, uh, et cetera. And so the fact that this variant, uh, they wouldn't be smoking more, they would still be smoking 20 cigarettes, so they'd be getting more out of every, every cigarette. The fact that this variant uh, related to disease would help point to that exposure. And that's a sort of toy example, uh, but um, uh, the uh, genetic uh, um, modification or, or a genetic variants in the pathways for which those exposures may act could be used to say, because there'd be a whole host of ubiquitous exposures that will differ between a low and high um, uh, risk populations, but the genetic variants can help, could help point to the exposure of importance. Um, next. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe one uh, little window on the fact that uh, such ubiquitous ex environmental exposures may exist uh, can come for the uh, currently rather thin, but uh, uh, increased, um, but uh, studies are obviously ongoing uh, evidence about uh, uh, cancer in animal in wild animal uh, populations uh, where changes were likely to reflect uh, anthropogenic changes in the, in the environment. So, and then uh, there was no collusion between <laughs> Jan and I. I was uh, going to finish by say, uh, on Dol and Pito's um, causes of uh, cancer, because I mean, this, uh, th th this uh, um, report uh, utilized basically the populations with decent cancer registries, but the lowest rates for, for uh, particular, any particular cancer versus the, the places with decent cancer registries and the highest uh, rates, and use that as saying that that gives you an idea of what in principle could be prevented because there's no, uh, because migration studies, uh, you know, et cetera, you combine it with other, other study designs that, 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 you, that um, you, know, you can say that uh, in principle, uh, you, you should, you know, all populations should be able to have the lowest, uh, the risk of the, of the uh, lowest population. So they use that to estimate the potential uh, in principle um, preventable proportion of cancers. And I think their, their estimates would now be very different for, they, I don't, I don't, they would not uh, um, come up with uh, very high estimates for diet, but maybe these, maybe the, the, the component that goes into diet, uh, it, it, maybe, the, maybe this is a ubiquitous component which might um, uh, be potentially uh, detectable. And infection, of course, the uh, estimates were, uh, would be higher than the, the high end of their range um, now. And I just to finish to say that, uh, yeah, and then the next, next slide. If there's, if there's one paper uh, you read after this seminar, I'd suggest that it's this 1977 paper from Richard Pito. And uh, um, Jan mentioned Richard Pito's letter in The New Scientist, which, uh, but the, the basis um, for that reasoning is laid out in this extraordinary paper that, uh, I, that uh, was published in an obscure book with many uh, uh, uncorrected uh, uh, errors. And uh, we, uh, in the last issue, I think, of the IJE I edited with Shah Ibrahim, we um, published a, a, a Richard Pito uh, helped us get a corrected version. And uh, I'd highly recommend this paper. OK, George. Thank you very much for that overview. I uh, propose that we continue with the talk since we have lost a little bit of time, but not too much, fortunately.
Uh, and our next speaker is uh, Olaf Dekker. Uh, Olaf uh, studied medicine, but uh, studied philosophy also uh, alongside of his medical studies. Um, specialized in endocrinology. And um, after the specialization in endocrinology, uh, became interested in epidemiology and methods of clinical investigation. He now has a professorship on methods of clinical investigation at Leiden. And uh, Olaf, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. Okay, so thanks Jan for the invitation and thanks George for paving me the path. Um, because George already showed all the empirical evidence that exists for chance. So I don't need to go there into detail and I will keep it simple. I would like to introduce a patient to you. This patient is called Joe. Uh, and Joe is coming to you because he thinks that he has an increased risk for cardiovascular disease or for myocardial infarction. And Joe did some homework. So he typed in, in a framing hang risk score app. Um, he typed in his age, his blood pressure, his cholesterol level. And he said, well, I apparently seem to have a predicted cardiovascular risk of 10%. 10%. And then he asks you whether you, he should consider a pill. Um, but first, Joe says to you, well, this is very old. This Framingham study is very old. And if I remember correctly, you, you in medicine, you spend a lot of money on what we call personalized medicine. Uh, and even Barack Obama considered this to be a main topic of his policies, because what Barack Obama is telling us is that all people should have personal information and that this personal information can be used to predict disease outcomes or to predict treatment effects. So Joe is asking, say, well, can't we do a better job, a more personalized approach, please? So you as a doctor, you're doing your homework as well. Uh, and you find a study published three years ago and you go to Joe and say, well, Joe, you need to have another blood sample, uh, but then I have a more fancy approach for you. Um, it's based on some very fancy proteins. You can see it in the slide, these proteins do have some names. And the risk score is an algorithm based on all these proteins. But I have to tell you, Joe, that now your risk seems to be even higher. It's 18%. Um, but the good news, Joe, is that we have something for you and we call it a pill. This is a very new pill, fancy pill, very expensive pill, as most of the new pills are. Um, okay, so Joe, um, but can you please tell me what I gain from taking the pill? And this is a slide where you can see what will happen to Joe if he takes the pill. So from 100 persons, we said that 18 persons would in the end have a myocardial infarction. Um, but if you take the pill, the risk for myocardial infarction is only six out of 100, so 6%. Whereas at the same time, your harm is not only increased, but it's now considerable. So seven out of 100. So you say to Joe, this really is a good pill. It's an expensive pill. It's a fancy pill, and it reduces your risk from 80% to 6%. So you think that, you're, that Joe now is convinced, but Joe is still a bit stubborn. And he says, well, doctor, um, to be fair, you promised me a personalized prediction, but actually what I get is still a population risk. Uh, and it doesn't matter that this is now based on a more fancy protein-based approach. And the same for treatment. Um, I get a population average, and I know that I, there is net benefit in five out of 18. But why can't you tell me whether I belong to the five out of 18 patients who benefit from treatment, or whether I belong to the patients who don't benefit? Uh, because in the end, it matters if I belong to the 5 out of 18, I will take the pill. But if I belong to the 13 out of 18, I won't take the pill. And to put it in a broader perspective, you can say that there's a clear tension between population probabilities, like 18%, and the individual risk. Because in the end, the individual risk will always be one of or zero. Uh, 
Joe will get a myocardial infarction, yes or no, and this is prevented by the pill, yes or no. And I will call this clear tension between the population probability and the individual risk. I will coin it for today, it's an official name. I will call it Joe's problem. Um, and what are the issues we need to discuss when considering Joe's problem? So I think you can translate the question from Joe into a more fundamental question. And you can say, well, is the effect of a treatment, is it fully determined for an individual? So if Joe takes the pill, will it be certain whether the pill will work or not? And for sake of the argument, we can consider that it's only a single pill or a vaccine, doesn't matter for now. Um, and for the epidemiologists and statisticians in the audience, it's probably good to know that I assume that variables are perfectly measured and that we have no issues with model specifications and so on. A second and related question is, if the effect is more or less determined for an individual, uh, can we know whether it's fully determined or not? Because it can be indeed that it's indeed determined, but that our knowledge um, is not at a level that we can know whether the effect is fully determined. And I think it, do it doesn't need much emphasis that this is a question and a discussion about causality or causal effects in this case of pills. So what is the outline of my talk after this introduction? Um, I would like to touch very, very briefly on David Hume. Um, if there are some philosophers in the audience, please excuse me that I'm so short about Hume. Uh, I, not intending to do the discussion about causation in Hume any justice. Then I will talk about what I will call the knowledge gap argument. I will talk about the issue of external factors and I will talk about snowballs. Um, and in the end, I hope to have convinced you that treatment effects do not seem to be fully determined. Um, and because that this is the case, there may be room for chance or randomness. I will use the words um, interchangeably, although I know that some philosophers make a distinction there. And for those of you who are interested, I have a, um, I have a paper at the end of uh, the talk with more details on that distinction. So let's start with David Hume. So David Hume is very often taken as a starting point for a discussion about causation. Um, sometimes people start with Aristotle, but, but move on very quickly to David Hume. Um, and he's highly influential also in thinking in medicine about causation. Um, and, and I think we can uh, attribute three claims to David Hume. Um, David Hume claims that cause-effect relation is a relation in terms of necessity, meaning that if A causes Y, it means that A causes Y necessarily. Um, his other point, and the second point is probably his most influential point, is that he says, well, we don't observe directly a cause effect relation. Huh? So we don't have an, um, a sense or a grasp of what is a cause and what is an effect in a way that we can perceive whether something is red or not let alone that if we think that something is a cause or an effect, we do not see that this is a necessary condition. Um, and this brings you to this idea that he says, well, there should be a kind of necessary condition between the two. We can't observe them. So we have to infer it from a regular occurrence of an association, meaning that because we always see that A follows B, we infer that uh, A is causing B. So much about Hume uh, not meant to be uh, to do him any justice in this respect. The problem, however, if we go to medicine, uh, that causal relations are most of the time expressed in terms of probabilities or risks. So we say to Joe, your risk of myocardial infarction is 18%. Um, but that's really something different compared to the idea of a necessary relation between A and B. And even if we say that smoking causes lung cancer, we don't say it does necessarily so. We say, well, it does so in approximately two, three, or four percent. And this again is Joe's problem. So if we consider the treatment effects are necessary causes, in the sense of David Hume, 
why do we still get only population averages? And I think most of the time implicitly, but there's a way out in medicine. So we say, yeah, that's true. We have some necessary causes. Um, and we acknowledge that, for example, a drip prevents a myocardial infarction in one person, but not in the other. Um, then we say, well, this is because there are differences between the two. So if a drug prevents a disease in Joe, but not in his brother, Jack, then there should be a difference between Joe and Jack that can explain the difference. Um, this, however, would mean if this would be true, that would mean that the statistical regularity is not the most fundamental association that we have in medicine. Because we say, if we look closer and we find all the details, we find that there's a difference explaining the difference in outcomes. Um, and that brings me to my second point, which is called the knowledge gap. Because in a way you can say, well, if Joe and Jack are more or less similar, but there's a difference in outcome, there should be, if we have a closer look at Joe and Jack, there should be a difference. Um, so it's a kind of state of knowledge if we can't find a difference. But let me argue that it's quite hard to have complete knowledge of individuals. And I think George already touched on this in the previous lecture. And let me go back to Joe, because now Joe says, well, please tell me, am I the one who will benefit from treatment? So probably you don't need only to measure my proteins, but please also measure my genes. So you do so, you measure his whole genome. Um, but then you start a discussion and say, well, Joe, we now have your proteins, but probably we should also have your lipids. Um, and not only, only your cholesterol, uh, your HDL and LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, uh, there's much more fancy stuff out there. And, and I think you can't read uh, what is on this picture, but it presents the different uh, lipids that are around in the human body. So we call it a lipidome, which is basically a name that uh, summarizes all the types of lipids that, that swim in the body, so to speak. Um, and you say to Joe, we're going to measure that as well. Um, one problem, these lipids are not stable. Proteins are not stable. So probably we should have measured it yesterday as well, the day before as well. Probably we should have measured it directly after smoking because that might also change your lipids and proteins. Um, and then you have the environmental factors. You need to take them into account as well. So we have lipids, we have proteins, we have environmental factors. And in principle, to have complete knowledge about Joe, we need to have measured it over time. Um, and if I say that the information for a single person is complete, I mean that the T times V matrix is complete, meaning that at all relevant time points, you have measured basically everything. Uh, you might argue that you don't need to measure everything all the time because, for example, hormones display some rhythm. Uh, so maybe two, three days is enough. But still, you can consider that you should measure a lot of things over time. Take blood pressure. That changes over time. That changes over the years. So for Joe, I think Joe is lost because we can't go back in time and measure everything uh, over the last 50 years. Joe is 50 years. So I think the knowledge gap argument as a kind of argument to say, well, in principle, you, it's determined. The only problem is that we lack knowledge about everything in a single person. Um, this knowledge gap argument, I think, runs into three different problems. First is very practical. It's really impossible to measure everything. Um, and even if you have something like that's called highly intelligent intrahuman wearables, um, then still you need to measure things within organs because, for example, levels of stress hormones differ in different organs. So from a certain perspective, you can say, well, this is a practical issue and not a fundamental issue. I think it's a fundamental issue as well. The second point, however, is that if you use, like we do in epidemiology or very often medicine, if you use other populations or reference populations or previous populations, to estimate Joe's risk. Um, and you say that this T times V matrix, uh, you take that seriously, then in the end, every person gets unique. You measure so many variables, 
every person is in the end unique. And then you don't have reference populations anymore to see what Joe's risk actually will be. Um, and the other point is, I think that there's no empirical evidence that such an approach with measuring everything simply means that you know um, whether Joe will get a myocardial infarction or not. So there is no empirical evidence that this approach uh, will in the end solve the problem of Joe. So that's the first point I would like to make. Then the second point, so we've looked back, uh -huh, we have said at time is zero, we start treatments, uh, and before that we can measure everything to, to determine whether the treatment works or not. Um, so let me go to the issue of external factors. This is Joe, uh, we suppose that we have measured everything. Joe is treated at time is zero with this very fancy pill, um, and for some reason, we now know that Joe will get a myocardial infarction despite treatments. But then something happens after Joe took his single pill. Um, what does it mean? Well, for example, you can say, well, his brother got a myocardial infarction. Maybe Joe now starts to eat salad, which he didn't do that much before. That might change his myocardial infarction risk in a way that probably was not predicted in the initial T times V matrix. Or Premier Rutte starts for whatever reason a healthy food campaign and Joe starts to adapt his diet. Um, or even the fact that Joe gets his myocardial infarction predicted with 80%, 18%, sorry, um, that might lead to a change in behavior of Joe. But still someone might say, well, if you measure all the genes, then probably also the behavior of Joe is predictable and therefore it's determined how we will react and how the treatment will work. But I think the last three um, examples I will give here, in the, um, you can't predict that from within Joe variables. So for some reason, Joe falls in love with a beautiful Italian girl. He moves to Italy and there he has to adapt his diet. He eats salad, he starts uh, eating only ol olive oil, a Mediterranean diet. And that will, of course, influence his myocardial infarction risk in a positive way. Um, there might be, for reason George might better know than I, that there is decreased air pollution. You can't predict this from all the things you have measured in Joe. An extreme example that philosophers always like, although they are normally quite peaceful, um, the atomic bomb might go off. Um, meaning that Joe will not get a myocardial infarction anyway. So even if you consider that this matrix is complete and that the behavior might be determined, um, then still you can't say that an individual treatment effect is fully determined. Um, and I would say you have to say that the treatment prediction system is open. It's open to external interrupters that you could not have predicted based on your initial variables. Um, and if this is the case, then these external factors can um, be said to be random with respect to the initial system. So this leaves randomness for treatment outcomes in Joe. Very short, there are two ways out uh, for people who want, still want to claim a full deterministic picture. Um, you can say, well, you only need to broaden the scope of the prediction at T is zero when Joe takes his pill, you have to take into account all the variables that are out there in the universe. Um, this will be quite hard to measure, I think. Um, and this would mean that you say, I believe in a sort of full-blown determinism. Uh, two things about that. Um, in quantum physics, there are experiments saying that this is not, can't be true. Um, and I think it's more a belief than that there's empirical evidence that full-blown determinism works. The other way out would be that you say, well, claiming um, that these predictions only work under stable background conditions. Uh, that might be fine, but then you shift only the problem towards the question whether in the end we can predict whether the background conditions are stable or not. Um, and as you can see, for example, in all the COVID condition, in all the COVID predictions, background conditions are not stable, simply. So my final point is the shortest point is about snowballs. So consider this snowball rolling down the hill 
And I would like to ask you the question, will the snowball cause an avalanche? Quite likely, you will say, well, that depends. Well, depends on what? It depends on laws of gravity, temperature, consistency of the snow, uh, the wind. Um, and you can think of many other factors that are out there that you need to take into account whether the snowball will cause an avalanche. Um, there also might be a snowboarder. Consider my son, for example, he's a snowboarder that crossed the snowball's path and thereby interrupting the probability of being an avalanche. But, but I think this can be considered an external factor like I uh, tried to explain in the previous part of the talk. But if you say it depends, you say, well, it's quite hard to come up with a calculation uh, that predicts with high certainty whether there will be an avalanche, yes or no. Calculations backwards are much easier. So if you find an avalanche and you calculate back, you say, well, it's quite necessary. Um, and it was in a sense determined that this snowball caused an avalanche. Yeah, that's true, but that's because the outcome already occurred. And calculations forward, I think are quite impossible if the goal is a precise prediction and not only a probability. Um, and I'm not talking about very well-designed uh, or highly controlled experiments here. Uh, and, and this is summarized in a quote from Hans Kampener uh, in Ocular Lecture that the minu minutest inexactitudes will multiply factor by factor. So your information is gone, meaning that even if you take into account all the factors, it's quite hard to predict with certainty what happens. So what you can do is you say, well, you have a range of likely outcomes that are compatible with the initial state. Um, you don't need to break the laws of any of, of physics or biology, but a range of outcomes is plausible given the, um, the, the conditions at time is zero. And the range of possibilities, I think it's quite easy to imagine gets wider as we consider longer paths. So it's quite, easy to predict the weather for tomorrow, and it's quite hard up to being impossible to predict the weather in five years. Um, and to conclude, I have two small examples. So if you take a COVID vaccination or another vaccination, this is not about COVID uh, at all. Um, I think it's unpredictable or indetermined to know with certainty what will happen to your immune status after the vaccination. Um, because it's determined by so many factors. And, and consider a very simple one. If you're very scared, your cortisol level might be higher and cortisol suppresses the immune system. So probably basically if you have fear for your vaccination, it might be that the vaccination effect is slightly lower compared to a person without fear. Um, if you predict someone who dies from cancer, that doesn't mean that you know when and how it will happen. So we have prediction where we have a cer certainty about the outcome, but still the path is quite undetermined. And that brings me to my conclusion, I have three for you. So I think it's quite impossible to show that treatment effects are fully determined um, based on a set of measured variables, even if this set is infinitely, infinitively large. Um, I think treatment effects are affected by external factor, factors, and this will add to what I will call indeterminateness. Um, and causes or treatment can exert an effect in many different ways. So this a single way does not seem to be fully determined. It's only afterwards that we can say, well, it seemed to be that this will was fully determined. Um, and having said this, I have to say sorry to Joe, um, because Joe asked for a very precise individual prediction, meaning a one or zero prediction. Um, and given that I think that there's still room for randomness in treatment effects, I think it's impossible to say to Joe whether it will be a one or a zero. And I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Olaf, thank you very much. Um, I will know if you close off your screen and, and mute yourself and I will take over.
So I'm now giving the screen to myself and I hope that I'm quite audible. Before I start off, I would like to encourage you all to put in as many thoughts and questions as you have into the Q&A uh, button, because that will greatly facilitate uh, the chair of the panel discussion to structure the discussion already beforehand. Um, my talk is, uh, the third talk is about uh, medicine as a stochastic art. And as you see, I'm based in Leiden in the Netherlands, but I'm also working uh, in Aarhus in Denmark and in London. The aim of my talk is uh, to bring home the idea that randomness, stochasticity in medicine has already been discussed a long time before, 2000 years before actually. And in the course of the history of medicine, it has led to different views about the nature of medicine. My talk is based on two papers, one that I wrote together with Katerina Hiro Diakonau and one that she wrote uh, on her own in 1995, which had to do with this very subject. She is a historian and a philosopher of science who works both in Greece and Geneva. We would have liked very much to have had her here tonight, uh, but this was impossible at the last moment, so I will present some highlights from our papers, and also, of course, give my own interpretation of some of these issues. The ancient Greeks classified medicine as a stochastic art. Why? Because there is unpredictability between means and end. A doctor can treat a patient according to the best of precepts in the most competent way and still the patient's condition may deteriorate and he may die. And the ancient Greeks had other uh, arts that they classified as being stochastic, like rhetoric, the art of rhetoric, the art of public speaking, which we are doing now. Um, and they, they said, well, even if you use all the tricks of the book, if you, of, of, of rhetoric, if you use the most logical arguments, it is possible that you still do not convince some of your audience. So there again, there is a difference between means and ends. In uh, contrast to a craft like building or weaving, because if you build a wall very competently, according to all the rules of wall building, the wall will stand straight. You will if you use competently all the rules of wall building, you will not end with a pile of bricks with rubble. While if you treat the patient very competently, still the end result may be disaster to the patient because of adverse effects and complications. So the aim of medicine, they said, is not to achieve a particular end, but to do everything possible to achieve that end. But they went one level deeper. Why is medicine like that? They wondered. And as Katrine Irodiak now unearthed, there was already debate about this at the end of the second century. There were two views. One view is by Alexander, who was a commentator of Aristoteles. And he said, well, medicine does not proceed by universal laws, that something is necessary and invariably the case. Medicine is not like that. Medicine does not proceed by syllogisms, but the laws of medicine are laws like, for the most part, or in only a rare case. And you, you hear echoes from the talk by Olaf from a few moments ago. But in contrast, Gallen, whose reputation is that he wrote a textbook that held for 1,500 years, so he might have known something, because that's quite an achievement. According to Gallen, medicine has universal laws. So it's as universal as everything else, but there are vagaries and idiosyncrasies of patients. The fundamental debate went on and on over centuries and, and, and boiled down to a question about, is medicine empiric or dogmatic? And at the end of the 18th century, William Cullen, who 
gave a course on the practice of physique that was very popular and very widely known in his time. He said, well, for 2000 years, two plans have been proposed for the study of medicine, but in the present state of science, either of them, dogmatic and empiric, is by itself insufficient. And this went on in the 19th and 20th century. Early in the 19th century, uh, Pierre Charles Alexandre Louis had a strong distrust of the medical theory of his time. Well, uh, it was all amongst others based on the position of the stars in heaven to predict the uh, outcome in a patient. And he strongly distrusted that idea. So he said that the only way out was empirical verification. He did his studies on bloodletting. And he strongly believed that numerical data would lead to hypothesis. 30 years later, uh, Claude Bernard held the view that medicine is based on pathophysiological and physiological reasoning and experimenting. And he had a great distrust of statistics, as he wrote in his introduction to the la médecine experimentale. Again, in the middle of the 20th century, all the advance of basic science, antibiotics, antihypertensive, immunosa, et cetera, which looks like dogmatic achievements from theory. But in the second half of the 20th century, there was a kind of backlash with evidence-based medicine, the Cochrane collaboration, a wave of distrust of medical theory, renewed claims that hypothesis and action should be based on observation with perhaps little theory or maybe even without theory. In today's medical practice, when explaining or reasoning, doctors do so in a dogmatic way, like Gallen would have done it. They will explain in general to a patient, your cerebral artery is blocked by a clot that causes, etc., etc. We will bring a catheter close to the clot and inject the substance to dissolve it. This is a dogmatic reasoning based on general principles. But they will also always explain that the therapy helps in the large majority of cases and the mishap can occur in only a rare case. And if we turn the page to the latest events in the history of medicine, we think about today's medical science and the development of the SARS COVID vaccines. The development of these vaccines was purely dogmatic. I once heard a lecture by Antoine Foss who explained they were designed in a few days because there was a cassette with a code present on computer, cassette with code for a multiplier that would multiply a, a string of, of, of RNA codes in, 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 in human tissue. And in this cassette, they had to plug in the codes for some of the spikes of uh, the virus. So this was designed in silico. This was designed on computer based on general principles. And the synthesis was done by machines out of these, out of com other computers, the, uh, the, the vaccine was synthesized. Then of course, there were some checks and balances, like if it worked in guinea pigs and maybe in other animals and whether there were um, antibodies uh, in humans and T cell immunity and all that was perfect. So this was a completely dogmatic development. However, everybody knew that we needed to have large scale empirical trials in humans to see how good it really worked and whether there were adverse effects. It worked much better than everybody could have hoped, which could not have predicted by theory. Um, in the trials, there were not too many uh, adverse effects seen, but the adverse effects were mainly seen in the wild when it was uh, given to a larger number of people. And these adverse effects, they were not predicted from theory. There was nobody who said, well, with that structure of that vaccine, you will have venous thrombosis, preferably in cerebral veins of females. That's not something that anybody thought about beforehand. Afterwards, when it happened, people said, well, 
uh, we can explain the coagulation happenings. I'm not certain whether they can already explain or whether they can explain that mainly that it, that it is predilection for cerebral veins in younger women. Um, so it still is only a partial explanation. We see a start with dogma going on empirical. From the empirical, we go back to more explanations and more theory. My conclusions are that the randomness of medicine has been discussed for a long time, led to different views. And interestingly, that the discussion is independent of the state of medical science, because for us, it's easy to say, well, of course, the theory of ancient Greek of the early 19th century, the Galenic humors, the stars in heaven, they could not have worked. So everything is random. But strangely enough, even with today's medicine, of which we know it works, it's not bogus, it's not stars in heaven, it works, we have proof of that, we still face the same problem of stochasticity, as explained by Olaf. So we have nothing else to conclude that in the present state of science, either of them is by itself insufficient. Before I continue and give the screen to the chair of the panel, there is one person in the audience that I would like to thank, and that is Jos van der Meer, because Jos van der Meer suggested that we should have a meeting about this topic of randomness in medicine already several years before, and he went on pushing it, cajoling us before Corona, during Corona, until the day that uh, to, uh, until today that we have this seminar. Thank you, Jos, for your perseverance. I now will close my screen and then my and give the screen to Brenda Penix for the panel discussion. Yes, thank you very much, Jan. Um, can I ask all the uh, speakers to share the, um, the screen and unmute because then I think we can have interactions. Thank you very much for three great talks. Um, and it's, it's great to see some coherence in the talks um, and some, um, I would say not overlap, but an extension of each other's topics. So really, Nice to have this focused um, theme on, on chance and randomness in, in medicine. And there are several questions uh, that have been um, put in the question and answer box. I would uh, propose that people keep doing that. I'll try to keep up with that. And also you can um, upgrade a question by uh, pressing on the um, uh, thumbs up button. Most people have done that. So maybe start with a quite general question um, that probably can be addressed by, by some of the, the speakers in, in different ways. And that's um, a more general question on how should we now deal with chance in drawing conclusions from epidemiological studies? And also a related question to this is, uh, what does the fact that outcomes can occur by chance mean for reprodu reproducibility of studies? So is, is randomness and is chance impacting on reproducibility and, and in what extent? Maybe, maybe George, you can start. Maybe Olaf can add. Uh, so, um, I mean, in, in terms of uh, in sort of dealing with chance, I don't think you're ever going to deal with chance in terms of uh, reducing its uh, Contribution. I mean, you know, if you if you have um, completely clonal creatures in completely standardized environments, then you're not going to reduce uh, the you're not going to reduce your variation uh, below uh, below that uh, uh, below that level. Um, I, I think the the issue for is that for epidemiologists, I don't think that in fact between individual risk is uh, is actually a, a particularly interesting. Uh, issue because so an epidemiology is, is a group level uh, discipline and I, I think it only makes sense uh, when one's considering aggregates and I think that's uh, something that has run through epidemiological thinking uh, from what you know we saw Greenwood on that and then uh, Jeffrey Rose's 
um, uh, you know, notions about sick individuals and sick popul populations. Uh, you know, it's a more contemporary version of that, and, and so it's carried on. Uh, so, I mean, the between population uh, uh, risk can, of course, be uh, can be dealt with without there being any uh, reduction in the in the degree of variation. So, uh, if, if there are, if there are widespread or you you know ubiquitous causes that can be removed, then the, then the, then uh, uh, then you can make extremely substantial uh, have extremely substantial effects on. Um, uh, 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 on outcomes. Yeah, so, so to add, mm -hmm. um, so I agree that, that generally in, in, in epidemiology we're considered about populations, but, but it might even be that if chance really plays a role and if chance plays a stable role, that population estimations um, and individual risk starts to become the same. So say for example, you're God, you know everything, then if chance plays a role, then it still may be that for an individual person, the risk for myocardial infarction is 0.8. Um, and then if you narrow down all the important variables, it might be that in, at the population level, you still find that 80% of the people will get, an, will get a disease. So um, it might not be that this will lead or give additional food for replication crisis. Maybe, maybe a more practical question that had a lot of folks, um, and that is more related from the perspective of doctors. So we know that randomness exists, but how can we best transfer the importance of the role of randomness in predicting treatment outcomes or in explaining occurrence of disease to our patients or to the community? Should we do that differently? Should we do that better? And, and how, how can that be best done? Somebody dares to take that question because I think this is a very general question, not specifically geared towards one of the presenters. Yeah, so, so, so maybe I can start as, as, as a doctor. <laughs> I think very, still very often we, we give people um, uh, probability. So, for example, if you go for surgery, the surgeon will tell you that the risk for complications is whatever it is. Um, and then in explaining this, it doesn't really play a role um, whether there's room for any, any randomness. You say, well, this is simply what it empirically turns out to be. So I think it doesn't need to complicate your explaining risks to patients. Um, it might complicate the matter a lot unless your patient is a philosopher, um, which is very often not the case, I can tell you. Do others agree? Arch and Jan? No, I'm, I'm not a practicing doctor, so I won't comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then maybe another general question um, is, is can chance be separated from unidentified effects? Which is also a very general question. So can we better uh, take out the unidentified effects from chance? Is there anything we can do to approximate those effects? Well, I mean, I, 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 uh, as I said, I, I, don't, I think you can't think that you're going to uh, sort of reduce the variability um, below what you can do when you, when you have completely controlled situations. That's, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, in, you know, in, in living organisms. So I think that, that it, it, gives, it, it gives you a sort of you know, minimum uh, to, which, to which you can go. I mean, the, for example, the, using the, your, the expressed risk, the observed risk in a monozygotic twin uh, gives uh, gives you the best you can do with with um, you know, combined with with um, genetic you know predicting with uh, genetic factors for example, and uh, one of the questions in the in the Q and A uh, to me which relates to sort of can relate relates to this would be um, saying well um, if if, uh, if you know you're talking about the role of prediction but what about in, in treatment 
you know, the, 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 yeah. the, the, there might be treatment which is more successful in given individuals and it might be possible to identify who those individuals are. Well, there's a, there's a very nice way, if you have, a, if you have continuous outcome, if you're, if you're you know, treating uh, you know, uh, schizophrenia, for example, and you're measuring the outcome with some uh, you know, quality of life scale or, or whatever, uh, and you have, uh, you have a randomized trial, uh, um, if there were, if, if, if you might think that, well, that treat, your treatment is working in some people, but not working uh, in others. It's treating, you know, it's improving some people, some people are not, in, not working in others. Then the, the logic of that means that if you, if you look in your placebo group and your treated group, the variance uh, of the, the variance of that outcome must be inflate, must be expanded, increased in your treatment group because you're treating some people and some people are staying where they are, whereas your placebo group is just staying where they are, where they are. Uh, unless you have some uh, utterly implausible, perfect crossover effects, which are utterly implausible, um, the, 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 the uh, variance of the outcome must increase. So, um, so this is something which has only really been, uh, even though R.A. Fisher um, um, mentioned it in a, in, in a letter in the... Uh, uh, um, uh, 70 uh, years ago, 70 or 80 years ago, in uh, relation to agricultural experiments, it's only very recently been applied, uh, and it has to be said in situations where it's been applied, um, it, which it has been, in, in, a, in, for example, in looking at trials of uh, treatment in schizophrenia, uh, and it's been used looking at in trials of trying to lower blood pressure, etc. Uh, there's a very there's little evidence of um, such uh, increase in variance, um, which, which, as I say, uh, uh, unless you, you make implausible assumptions, uh, must occur if there is heterogeneity of treatment response. So you can get you can get some sort of global uh, estimates of whether there is any uh, heterogeneity, uh, meaningful heterogeneity of response. Thank you. Um, Sarah, you Another question, I think, is, is probably for Olaf. Um, a question whether you can expand a bit more on the analogy of backward and forward calculations for the snowball. And then epidemiology medicine, to what extent can we put a backward calculation? So imagine once Joe has had an, an eye, how much can we say about the chain of causation leading to it? And, and should we be trying to do that? I think that this this is really an, an, an interesting point. So so with the snowball, it's um, you can do some calculations, of course, because you can see the path. You can you know what the weather is. You know what the wind was at that time. You know what the temperature is. You can even do some measurements in the snow. Um, tracing back, especially over longer time periods, affects to causes in in a in a way that you can do with snowballs is quite difficult because in humans you can't see pathways most of the time huh? unless you've broke i think the only exception is when you have a knife in your heart it's, it's quite obvious to see the pathway from from knife to to <clears throat> all in your heart and dying um and and then you ask about how uh, how do we discover for example that smoking cause lung cancer and and it brings about the question how do we discover discover causes in epidemiology and maybe Jan can say something about that. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the problem with causes in epidemiology is indeed that, that you don't see them happen. Uh, and, and, and with the avalanche and the snowball, you, 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 you see it more or less happen and you, you see the path. But if you think about um, or if you see a tree falling on a car, I mean, it's clear. But if you think about smoking and lung cancer, then uh, the majority of smokers will not develop lung cancer. Some will develop it uh, rather soon. Others will develop it very late. Um, so there is no immediate grasp of what's going on from observation. And in addition, we do not yet know the path uh, very well. Um, and that makes it, 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 that makes it uh, exceedingly difficult to, 
to, to ascribe uh, causality in epidemiology, in my view. Yeah. There is another question that probably relates a little bit more to the impact of uh, randomness for, for healthcare. And that is, does the acknowledgement of randomness have a negative impact on people's motivation to comply with uh, medical advices? So uh, can it backfire in a certain way? Oh, so as, as the first go here, um, I hope not. Huh? So take again Joe. Um, if Joe gets his myocardial infarction predicted with 18%, and you consider this completely determined, it doesn't matter what you do anymore. Um, but if you consider there's, that there's room for improvement external factors or indeterminateness, then that even leaves room for saying, okay, I'm going to take care that this 18% will be lower in reality by, by eating some salad. So it might also be the other way around. That should be um, used in clinical practice probably to uh, even motivate people more. Um, been, there, there has been quite a lot of um, uh, you know, research on the effects of adding uncertainty in, uh, in, in communications. I mean, probably yeah. more, more in relation to sort of public health messaging, for example, as opposed to um, clinical advice, although I know it has been, um, there's been research in that area as well, David Spiegelhalter and uh, others have reviewed all uh, have reviewed this and, and have come to the conclusion that it doesn't that, that there's no there's no clear sort of detrimental effect. I mean, certainly in the UK, this was sort of an issue during the um, you know during the past uh, eighteen months about uh, about you know, possible um, over certainty being you know attached to to, to um, messages that were put out about you know, what was going to happen, the sort of future of um, the pandemic um, and uh, a sort of notion that, that uncertainty shouldn't be, if you acknowledged uncertainty, then that might have counter, that might counter the uh, effectiveness of the public health messaging. There's, there's, uh, there's, no, there's no sort of strong evidence that that's the case. Thank you. Um, I think we are almost nearing the end, also time-wise. It's uh, 2039. Um, so maybe a final question that also got uh, quite some echoes. And maybe it's a more general question. I think we partly touched on this already. But um, so, so people say, if, I'm happy to accept that there is inherent stochasticity, but still that doesn't rule out the possibility to narrow down the uncertainty ranges. So also in Joe's example, there might be some measurable variables that would give him a better informed choice. You know? So I think the, question, the underlying question here is, should we still do our best to better rule out uh, all the measurable variables so that we can um, reduce the, um, the impact of the unmeasured content? Um, do you agree with that? Is that what we should be focusing on and zooming in on? I think the very short answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think this this should just stimulate us to to improve our research. Yeah, there is, there is little there is little else we can do, but we, yes. I think that, that we should keep keep an eye on on, on sources and, and of randomness, and also also I think in in, in basic like in basic tumor biology, uh, there is always the question if there are these. A contralateral tumors in different organs of the similar organ, but uh, then at the other side, uh, how much they are alike each other or how much they differ biologically. And uh, this, I mean, this might also guide our thinking and uh, might be an interesting um, uh, way of continuing research about chance randomness also in, in the basic sciences. Yes. Oh, I think that's actually a very nice concluding remark, Jan. So thank you very much, because I think that really is a, a general conclusion that, that really fits well and gives also a message for the future uh, to all of us who are doing research. I would like, really like to thank everybody, uh, again, the speakers for excellent talks.
I know that this can be watched on YouTube as well. So uh, I, I really invite people who have missed parts or want to re relook at some, some aspects to, to do that. Um, it, it will remain on YouTube.